We are going to be in the book of First Peter again today. We're getting to a section that's probably the most difficult uh, of all in First Peter. Uh, to give you a quick summary of what we talked about before uh, in chapters 1 and chapter 2, basically uh, the early church is going through persecution, and Peter is trying to encourage the people to remain faithful by giving them perspective on uh, how blessed they are to be able to have the full knowledge of the gospel and to follow after Jesus as he suffered and to kind of um, become more like him. I guess it would help to have the Bible up there, wouldn't it? Um, there. It's trying. There we go. Okay, uh, so yeah, that's First Peter chapters 1 and 2 to kind of give you in um, uh, context to, to look at before we get there. Right, so for, uh, so this is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no, uh, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So the, the main point that Peter is trying to get here is if you look at Jesus, when he is suffering through the you know the, the the cross he's not someone who's complaining he's not someone who's upset he's taking what the world gave him and that should be your example if you're going through persecution as well verse 24 he himself bore our sins and his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness and by uh, his wounds who have been healed for you were like sheep but now have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. And so chapter 1 and chapter 2 is really good, nice, compact, kind of theologically rich. Um, it's more maybe theoretical than practical. Uh, it kind of gives you some, some good ideas about how to think about persecution and trial from a Christian perspective. As we transition here to chapter 3, it gets a bit more practical. Uh, we're used to the writings of Paul. And Paul usually begins with some long greeting that says something, and then here are some kind of theoretical, uh, theological concepts, and then he goes into practicality, right? Romans is kind of like that, in that he has the introduction, he has the, the main book of Romans, and then chapter 12, it becomes all, well, now that you know what the gospel is all about, here is how you ought to behave in a pragmatic or practical way. Now, the same thing for Peter here. This is uh, a text... <laughs> that, you know, we don't, well, we, I don't like to talk about a lot, I suppose. I prefer the Pauline way of writing about the roles of uh, various Christians from different backgrounds and, and genders and roles that we play in life. But here's what Peter has to say. <clears throat> it's interesting to me that we have the word likewise here um, in the English. It's kind of a transition, but also it's a continuation. So it's kind of like, well, we know how we're all as Christians supposed to behave and be like Jesus. Um, and so we look at this and we see, likewise, so in a similar kind of way, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of your wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So I want to just kind of give you the overall point, which I think is pretty clear if you're just looking at this sentence in the English. Um, we see the wives here being wives that are believers. They are Christians. And there's the possibility that they have husbands uh, that are not Christians and that they have rejected the word of God for whatever reason. It's possible then for a Christian wife to influence her non-Christian husband at home to become a Christian based on how she behaves. Now, it's not that big of a stretch because I'm sure if you've been in the church for any length of time, we know husbands and even elders who have been converted by their wives. Um, so that's definitely possible. It has been going on since the first century. 
There is this idea here that we don't um, like to dive too deep into it for some reason. In verse uh, 1, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 5, when Paul wrote that, it's the same kind of concept. You have the head over everyone, which is uh, God the Father, and then you have Christ, and then you have the husband, then you have the wife, then you have the children, then you have the slaves or the servants of the household. And all of those are addressed in Ephesians chapter 5. And so when Peter just kind of mentions it in verse 1, that wives are to be subject to their own husbands, this is not going to be a, an ethical problem for him or for anyone that would read this in that culture. Uh, it's not going to be a cultural problem because that's the way that the, the Roman world worked for a very long time. Although women had the ability to have possessions, to own property, to have businesses, um, it's not quite as progressive and feminist as it is today. Um, to kind of give you a context here, I think the ESV is going to help us a whole lot um, because it has these little cross-references, and some of them are not perfect, but some are really helpful, like this one. So uh, the ESV uh, New Testament has these connections to the Old Testament to kind of give you some more context. And so, again, this is miles away from the first century, but in Genesis chapter 3, as part of the, um, for convenience sake, we'll call punishment for eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is what it, uh, God says to the woman. Genesis 3.16, To the woman, he said, I will severe, uh, surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, which may imply that before that it wouldn't be as painful. Uh, there's debate about that, obviously. We'll never really know. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. And that's kind of a bad rendering of that from what I'm told. It shall be your desire shall be for your husband, not contrary to your husband. So meaning you want to be with your husband and maybe even you want to rule over your husband, but he shall rule over you. And so the kind of establishment of the husband being the head of the family is kind of all the way back here. It's also kind of an echo of man was created first, and then from man came the mother of all living, Eve. And so you kind of got that going on here as well. So that shouldn't be mind-blowing to anyone who's aware of the New Testament and the Old Testament. I mean, is this only cultural, though, is one major question we have to kind of ask ourselves. Sometimes when Paul writes especially, and we see it here in Peter too, um, some things are Word of God, inspired, here's what God says about the issue. There's no change from that. Uh, how to become a Christian, how to remain faithful, uh, all those kinds of things, are, are, they're constant, right? There are some things, though, especially in 1 Corinthians, for example, that are cultural, because culturally, if you're to behave in a certain kind of way as a free person, uh, you might bring dishonor upon the name of Christ by your, your behaviors. Now, that's subject to change because culture changes. I'm thinking about the idea of hair in uh, chapter 11 and head coverings and men having long hair. Those things shift, and so they're up for debate when it comes to our culture. Uh, but this is not cultural. If it were cultural, there would be some kind of implication here that this is not this is a, a new concept or something that's not rooted in a tradition from the Word of God itself, but because we can connect Genesis to how the family looks in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to also what Paul has to say in Ephesians chapter 5, for example, Colossians 3 as well, and then this jives with all of that. It all seems congruent. This is not cultural, so we can't just wash it away and say, well, now we have a feminist society, and so wives that have husbands, they can now rule the house in a spiritual way. That's not the way the family is designed, biblically. Um, now, practically, <laughs> meaning um, in a practical sense, day to day, uh, is a woman supposed to be subservient to a husband? No. It's, the word's not subservient here. It's subject or under the responsibility of. And so in a way, when we look at this, it's not really highlighting the woman's role of being subservient. It's actually highlighting the fact that women have a huge influence on the family, including their own husbands, which they should because they're 
people made in the image of God. Um, and so we see here that the conduct of the wife is encouraged to be, let's see, respectful, respectful and pure, uh, to be able to influence their husbands well. So if they're not, if they're not a Christian, that might win them over, which you know has happened and will happen. And if they are Christians, and even better, by the behavior, they encourage each other and they help each other as a family unit to um, provide a stable uh, basis upon which they can build and serve the Lord together. So anyway, that's one of those verses that nowadays is kind of blown out of proportion. And uh, if you hear criticism from the Christian family perspective, it's probably around this that husbands are bad and, and wives are better, and if you don't think that's the case, then you're wrong, and whatever, anyway. Okay, verse 3. Physical appearance is, I would say, a bit more cultural when it comes to fashion and hairstyles and jewelry and so on, uh, because we'll see things that are kind of discouraged in verse 3 that nowadays... Uh, it might mean something different. So the idea of being subject to your own husbands, that's not really cultural because that's consistent in Scripture. But there are some things mentioned here in verse 3 which are more cultural, and hopefully you can see that as we read it. So verse 3, uh, part 1, Do not let your adorning be external. Meaning, if you're going to... I don't know, how do you best say it? If you're going to show who you are to the world, don't let it be based on the external parts of your physical body. The braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. So the emphasis is if you're going to show the world who you are, don't make it be and only be about the fact that you have hair that's in a braid, or you're wearing gold, or you have nice clothing. That shouldn't be the emphasis. Now, again, braiding hair, gold jewelry, and nice clothing, that's a bit different in the first century world versus where we are today. I mean, you can buy very cheap gold jewelry. Uh, you can put your hair up in a nice braid or whatever kind of hairstyle you want. You can have nice clothing, and that's not really going to be the impression that you leave, right? It's just not a luxury thing anymore. Back then, it was. Uh, you had a lot of expense. You had a lot of um, you know, process to go through to be able to have nice braided hair and gold jewelry and fine clothing. Uh, so if that's where the emphasis in that person's life was and they're a Christian, they've got some things askew. So again, this is not condemning people that look nice, especially women or wives. Um, it's just the emphasis, I think, is the overall meaning. So verse 4, But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. So the perspective here is what the world sees about you physically versus what God sees about you inwardly. That's the emphasis. Because, verse 5, this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. And so again, there's the overall context here is if you've got a wife who is not willing to be subject to the husband or to the father of the household, and you've got a woman who's overemphasizing the physical attributes of wealth and um, and, and monetary things, that's someone whose priority is, is, is wrong, is, is askew. Now, verse 6 is hilarious to me because there's no way. <laughs> well, let's just read it, and I'll tell you why. Okay, as, so comparing who you are as a good Christian woman versus Sarah of the Old Testament, Abraham's wife. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him the Lord. All right, so let's go to the verse and talk about that. Genesis 18, verse 2, or 12. Uh, this is when the angels are there, and the angel kind of reiterates the promise that she's going to be uh, the mother uh, of a great nation. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? 
And so she's just doubting the fact that she's going to be a mother because she says she's worn out. <laughs> and, his, and my Lord, meaning Abraham, is old. And so the, the concept here is she is someone who is respectful to her husband. I think this is a bit more cultural than the other one. You can definitely be subject and have respect for a husband uh, without calling him Lord. I don't know of any real healthy relationship that I've ever seen where you see a wife who's serving as a servant or a slave to the husband. That's not really the picture we're going for here, obviously. I don't think Peter is trying to imply that. I think he's just saying if you want to be in good company of, uh, of someone who was subject to their husband, who respected him, who made decisions on her own, though, and um, was a good godly person, Sarah is a good example. So that's that. And you are her children if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. What a big ask. I mean, that's a big thing. Let's back up here. If you do good, well, that's a bit broad, right? So doing good things, um, that's, again, very broad. And do not fear anything that is frightening. Um, it's a bit of a weird way to word that. Let's um, change our resource Just look at how it's rendered elsewhere. Um, you have become her daughters as long as you do what is good and never let fears alarm you. Hmm. So again, same kind of concept there, right? But um, it's an interesting way to, to phrase it. It's a huge ask. I mean, uh, that's kind of that's kind of the point, right? Is to set that bar high. Uh, to be someone who is trusting in God so much so that fears don't control your life, I mean, that's, that's huge. It's a huge thing. It takes a long time um, at all to even kind of approach that. So anyway, it's interesting how it's, how it's rendered there. Okay, verse 7, and then quickly we have, you know, what, how many verses? You have six verses about how women should behave with their husbands, and then you have one verse from, a, from the male perspective, and this is the one that gives us the hardest time because we don't like the way it, it's said. Likewise, so in a similar kind of way, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Sounds a little condescending when you say it like that, right? Uh, husbands, you know, be aware that you need to understand where your wives are coming from, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Again, sounds a little condescending. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So what's that mean? Well, I don't really know. I know what, what Paul has to say in Ephesians chapter 5 about loving your wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I get that one. Uh, if you're willing to die for your wife, then surely you're willing to love her. Um, you know, despite whatever is going on and however you feel about the situation. This one's a bit more complex, and I struggle with the meaning. Um, so the word vessel here is the indication of she has a, it's a vessel meaning a, a body, right? A, a human body is often referred to as a vessel or a container, which has some layers to it, right? If you think about that, that we are just walking around in a, in a, you know, a vessel in a container that holds us, right? So a woman having a weaker vessel or body, I know a lot of commentators will say, well, it's just the fact that she's physically weaker than, than men. Um, what does that have to do with how husbands are supposed to, to treat their wives knowing that they're physically weaker, like they can't bench press as much as a man could? I don't really know. Um, so, I don't know. <laughs> I've read a bunch of commentaries about this issue, and everyone has the same questions, and no one really has a good answer for it. Um, that's why I default to Ephesians 5 with, with, with Paul about it. But that's a, that's a problematic passage, right? This is, a, this is a very problematic, in our culture especially, kind of way to look at the husband-wife dynamic. She's to submit to him, and he's supposed to live with her in an understanding way, knowing that she's a weaker vessel. Um, it doesn't mean weaker in character. I know it doesn't mean that. And it doesn't mean weaker in the sense of more frail or fragile, um, like, psychologically. So I don't know what to do with it. 
Uh, I wish I knew what Peter meant a bit more, but apparently that also messes with your prayer life if you don't live with your wife in an understanding way. I can imagine kind of comically how that would happen. If you don't live with her in an understanding way, then there's going to be a lot less time for you to pray because you're going to be fighting all day. Um, but anyway, again, problematic passage. Hard to explain because I don't really know what it means. So there you go. Verse 8, finally, all of you. So now we move beyond the husband-wife dynamic, and now we go back to just the Christian perspective. Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Now, if you think about that, kind of right next to the husband-wife dynamic, if you have a wife that has the same mind as you, the same mindset, has sympathy for you, has a love for you like you're a family member, which, I mean, you would be, a tender heart towards your husband and a humble mind towards your husband, you're going to fulfill the requirements I mentioned 1 through 6, right? And if you are a husband who has the exact same thing, unity of mind, sympathy, love, a tender heart, a humble mind, no doubt you're going to fulfill whatever verse 7 is talking about. And so again, there's, there's so much emphasis placed on what is my role in the family, what is my role in life, how do I specifically have to behave. You can go into those details with the individual roles, but there's always these phrases like, all of you behave this way. So if all of us do, you're going to fulfill that role. Um, so interesting little kind of thought. Okay, verse 9, this is definitely a... a a throwback or an echo or a tag to what Jesus was talked about in chapter 2. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. So don't behave like Christ didn't behave. But on the contrary, bless or give thanks to for or because to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing for, here's a quote, Whoever desires to love life and see good old, uh, good, uh, to see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil, and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So he's quoting here, let's see what the passage is. Uh, Psalm 34, to be able to emphasize how Christians ought to behave. Uh, this is a very simplistic kind of thought, but I mean, a lot of people, when they, they know that the New Testament is written for Christians, uh, talking about Christ and uh, the Acts of the Apostles and other Christians and so on, the, the question may be sometimes posed, why go back to the Old Testament uh, and learn about those things? Well, if you don't know that this is from Psalm 34, then, I mean, Peter is using this to preach about Christian behavior, righteous behavior. And so it's kind of important to kind of know where that stuff is and what it's talking about. <clears throat> now, verse 13. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. So we kind of get the echo again of uh, persecution. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So we pause there, and we sometimes see verse 15 pulled out of context from persecution to talk about, well, you know, if you're at Starbucks one day and someone says, are you a Christian? And you say yes, and they say why, you better have a good response. I mean, I guess, I mean... <laughs> You know, I, it's probably not a bad idea is to think about how to engage people in conversation in a positive way, uh, but this is not, not talking about that. Uh, that word defense here is legal. And so if uh, honor in your hearts Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone. So if they drag you to court and they say, why will you not sacrifice an animal to Caesar? You better be prepared for defending it well, defending your position well, and then also honoring God. So that's a lot of responsibility in that situation. Uh, verse 16, having a good conscience, uh, so that when you are slandered, when they make false claims against you legally, 
those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So again, we've mentioned that before uh, from the previous context. Because it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So again, the role of government there is to ideally punish evil wickedness and then to reward goodness. If that's not happening, it's not your fault. Uh, It's the government's fault. Because Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit. I think about John chapter 3 and the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. And uh, there was some flattery there, it seems, from Nicodemus to Jesus, and he just kind of shut that down and said, you must be born again. And there was that whole kind of humorous section where he goes, well, I can't go you know, back into the womb and be, be born again. He goes, if you don't understand what I'm talking about being born again, then we can't progress this conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so anyway, this is uh, Peter kind of using that phraseology from all the way back in John 3 to, uh, to bring about the idea of rebirth. <clears throat> Frog in my throat. Okay, verse 19. In, okay, all right, so let's back up. <laughs> this is the second problematic section in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. Because, or 4, verse 18, Christ suffered once for sins. He was righteous, he died for the unrighteous, that he might bring us, the unrighteous, made righteous to God. We are being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So, if you connect that with Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4 and 8 and 1, you've got the whole idea of us going down into baptism. That's where our old man dies, and we're raised to walk in the newness of life. And now that we're baptized into Christ, there's now no condemnation to those that are in him, Romans 8, 1. So that's, that's rebirth. That's becoming Christian. That's, that's the whole obeying the gospel deal. <clears throat> and now Peter's going to kind of use a tangent. Verse 19, so made alive in the Spirit, in which, in the Spirit, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Who are they? Great question. Verse 20, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Okay. Big text here. What in the world are we talking about that when Jesus died, he went to go preach or proclaim, let's see what the word there is, yeah, preached to the spirits in prison from the days of Noah? Well, great question. Uh, let's see if we can find the exact passage here. Yeah, let's go to Genesis chapter 6. I want to grab my Bible, my paper Bible. Well, I don't, I don't need it. Okay, Genesis 6. Let's just go there. Genesis 6 and verse 1. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. And they took as their wives any that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man or with man forever. Because he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. So he's going to have a life expectancy of about 120 before long. Verse 4, the Nephilim, whatever they are, we don't know what that word really means, is from the Hebrew. So it's just one of those Hebrew words that we don't really have a good English word for. Um, were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards. So, that's good. They were there then, and they were there afterwards too, somehow. When the sons of God, uh, sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. And then he goes to verse 5, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. 
For the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven, because I am sorry I have made them. But Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, what is that talking about? We have no idea, um, is the answer. There's a lot written about this, a lot of positions, a lot of thoughts, a lot of theories. We don't know what this is talking about. Um, and we've not known what this is talking about for a very long time. And so, once something that happened, or, or a book that was written between like 400 BC to possibly 150 AD, is called the Book of First Enoch. Enoch was the guy who was apparently kind of a prophet back in the day. Let's see if I can find him. Yeah. Um, so, Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. Uh, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah, who lived for a while. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus were all the days of Enoch 365. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, because God took him. So we look at that and say, well, he didn't die. God just took him home or whatever. We don't know much about him except for he walked with God. So someone thought it was a great idea to explain what Enoch was preaching and what this whole deal is in, in chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, with the daughters of man, the sons of God, and having children in Nephilim. And, and so first Enoch talks about this, uh, that they were angels that fell. Uh, they were attracted to female humans. They got them pregnant and they made giants, and they made all kinds of wild stuff, all the stuff that you would imagine uh, out of a piece of fiction trying to explain all of this. It's dramatic, right? But that's first uh, Enoch. The reason why I mention that now is because when Peter is writing about this, that there were spirits in prison, and that Jesus went to go preach to them from the day of Noah, uh, that's talked about in First Enoch a little bit. And so what Peter is doing here, we think, is he's referencing the work First Enoch, not necessarily saying it's true, but using that information as someone who grew up with those stories to kind of uh, further talk about what Jesus did. Um, does it make any sense? Not to me. <laughs> I mean, we have uh, the book of First Enoch referenced here. It's also referenced in the book of Jude. Uh, Jude actually quotes from 1st Enoch as well. And so does that mean that 1st Enoch is legit? It's from God? No, it means that the, these two guys, Jude and 1st Peter, grew up hearing these stories, and by inspiration they're referencing them to kind of talk more about Jesus. So it's complicated to say the least. But the point is not the fact that he went and talked to fallen angels who were kept in a prison somewhere in a spiritual sense uh, in Genesis chapter 6. That's not the real point. The point is uh, God's patience with the people while, he was, while Noah was building the ark is a testament to his long-suffering, but also that ark saved them through the water, right? Through the water of the flood. Now, that's the main point, because in verse 21, he connects the water from the flood and the ark that saved the people to the idea of water immersion or baptism for the Christian, which we know is part of the process of becoming a Christian from Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4, and then Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. You with me? Okay. Baptism, now cor which corresponds to this, the water of the flood, now saves you, not as a removal of the dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So just like the ark 
saved Noah and eight people through the flood. The water of baptism now saves you through death into life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's that. Um, we d debate and talk and preach a lot about baptism because if you look at you know, modern Christianity, there's not the emphasis on baptism or water immersion baptism, but the emphasis on trusting in God's grace and uh, praying for him to enter your heart and to cleanse you of sin, that's not biblical. It's just not in the Bible at all. Uh, believing definitely is, repenting definitely is, confessing definitely is, but the idea of asking Christ into your heart to save you from your sins, completely made up. And so if you're looking for a verse to fight about this whole idea of baptism being essential for salvation, this is the one, 1 Peter 3.21, that we have that says specifically from Peter's own mouth, baptism saves you. So if you want to be saved, baptism has to be a part of it. Now the, the counter argument to that, which I've heard, is that this baptism here is not water baptism, but it's spiritual baptism, right? So you accept Christ into your heart, and you're immersed with the Spirit of God, and that was, that's what saves you. That sounds great, except for the fact we're talking about the water from the flood in the previous verse. So there's no way that he's been talking about the literal uh, water of the flood, and then he transitions to a spiritual immersion of spirit from God. Uh, there's no way to prove that. There's no way that you would get that unless someone told it to you that way and that sounded good for what you already believed. So that's what I've heard. Um, some folks want to fight about that a lot. I don't enjoy debates. I don't enjoy conflict. I don't enjoy um, disagreeing with someone who's adamant and angry and emotional. I would much rather just have a logical discussion and questions and all that. That's much more effective, in my view, than fighting with people over this kind of stuff. But some people respond well to engagement and anger and emotion and stuff, but that's not me. So, okay, chapter 4, verse 1, we'll pick up next week, Lord willing. That's chapter 3. you got two major problematic sections in there. Obviously, what does it mean that Christ went in the Spirit to preach to those that were in prison before Noah? Uh, no idea. I guess we'll figure it out one day, or maybe we won't. We probably won't care by then. And then we got the weaker vessel, live with them with understanding, and then that's going to help your prayer life. Whatever that's talking about, too. Just be a good husband. Just love them. And then wives, love your husbands, too. So I guess that's it. Okay, thank you so much. We'll be dismissed now uh, until Sunday, and then Wednesday again. Uh, chapter 4 we'll pick up, and then we're making our way through First Peter pretty well. And go on to Second Peter, which if you thought those texts were difficult, just wait. It gets fun. <laughs>